about the Step Up program and how we at the Counseling Center in Irvine adopted the Step Up program specifically for stepping up and being having a, a bystander intervention around microaggressions, which is a really difficult thing to do. Um, but before we do that, I want to give you a little context. Most of your campuses, if not all of them, should have some familiarity with Step Up um, to some degree, as they may have adopted it on their own campus. There's a big movement nationally to really adopt this program. Um, and so the, the Step Up really originated back in Arizona, and then we, at, as the UC level, have adopted it. And these are the original individuals that have been a part of the National Advisory Board, including Doug Everhart from our campus had helped to sort of bring this program and it's now been adopted and it's been sort of unfolding across our campus and so last year I charged our intern cohort with the opportunity to develop a social justice project. And what they decided to do was to take this step up program and specifically tailor and modify the program to, to address microaggressions on campus. So they approached Doug Everhart, who's on our campus, and said, how can we, uh, we'd like to take this and we'd like to do this. And in part, it's in a response to some campus climate things that were happening. A lot of times when we think about racism or even just microaggressions, we tend to think about the historical perspective of a Caucasian individual against some sort of mar marginalized group. And what we were seeing on our campus is within group um, microaggressions or even blatant racism. And so our intern cohort decided they wanted to utilize this movement that's already occurring on our campus and sort of adopt it in that way. And so um, they took this under task, they took this task on and they were supervised by our director, Dr. Manessi, so she provided them support throughout the year as they developed this program. Um, and so in the absence of the rest of the intern cohort, I'm here to support my former intern and now amazing postdoc. One of the things as, so typically this program, the step up against microaggressions, is a couple of hours. So we're looking about a two hour intervention. We don't have time to do two hours today. So we're gonna give you a small excerpt of that actual program. Um, but even in doing that, and as we try and sort of invite you to engage in conversation with us, we really wanna acknowledge the disclaimer that the, the focus of this particular presentation can elicit some emotional, personal reactions. There's value systems and belief systems that get activated by this process. So so we really want to invite you to sort of take the time that you need to regulate and check, check with yourself in terms of what you need and um, know that we are available for offering support or checking in afterwards if you need to individually, uh, we'll stick around for that for you. Today, what we hope to focus is to, in the small little snip that we want to present to you, is we hope to increase and raise awareness of helping behavior and identify how it is even necessary within addressing microaggressions that occur on a campus or even just individually, not within a campus. Um, we also hope to increase and um, the motivation to help and develop the skills to, to help. I think a lot of times we're not sure how to intervene or that we um, sometimes don't take the personal responsibility to intervene. And so that's the idea behind Step Up, is sort of recognizing when is your opportunity to sort of step in there. Um, and then ultimately, the, the larger goal around addressing microaggressions is really trying to ensure a sense of safety across individual um, people and sort of really wanting to promote well-being of others, the self and others. And so that's what we're trying to sort of create as we um, implement this program across our campus. So given that we are talking to you all about step up and microaggression, what do you think? Why are you important? Why are we talking about this to you? We're going to have some discussions, some presentations. So it's going to be a mix, so <laughs> please feel free to participate. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, aside from having to be able to um, offer it as a service or training or skills to students, I mean, it happens in our life all the time. I mean, if you do it on campus, if you do it off, you don't have to. But it's knowing, feeling confident about how to do it and going to real life mm -hmm. makes it that much easier to teach or to explain or to help someone come to understand why it's important for what you're looking forward to do. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So other than just taking it as a training program and uh, applying it on your campuses, uh, one of the reasons that you are important is because uh, in many situations you might be the bystander and some microaggression might be happening in your environment and it might be helpful for you know the individual who's receiving it or maybe if you're receiving it to know what microaggression is to give it a name and maybe even to know like what can be done and when is it appropriate to do it is it appropriate to uh, step up right now or is it appropriate to wait or when what is the right thing to do so given that in many situations you can be the bystander when microaggression is happening we also want to acknowledge that most of the time or many of the time we all uh, engage in microaggressions right whether we are aware or not aware we all have engaged in microaggression at some time or the other so we play two roles here we can be bystander and we might be the person who is doing it so uh, when we talk about you as a bystander or bystander in general we see that bystanders can be of two different types. They can be active, they can be passive. Somebody who engages in the situation, who takes some step, would be the active bystander. Somebody who just is present there, sees something happens and just moves on, don't do anything, would be considered a passive bystander. So it's up to us to decide which one do we want to be. And then the positive and the negative. Sometimes people do want to engage in helping behavior and they're very motivated, very well-intentioned, but the way they intervene can be helpful or unhelpful. So when it's helpful, it's positive bystander. When it's not very helpful and it actually escalates the situation, it's negative bystander. So we definitely want to decide which one we want to be, so some reasoning goes into that. So given that our main focus today is on step up and microaggression, before we get into the details of microaggression, I want to check in with you all what is your understanding of microaggression? How many of you have ever heard of it? Uh, what do you understand of it? So if anybody wants to share. I have someone who's staring at me but smiling. <coughs> Care to share? <laughs> Very well summarized. You summarized the whole presentation. Great. Awesome. So, <laughs> so we're we can done. Go home. Great. Let's go get snacks. <laughs> so let's look at the definition given by Dr. Daryl Su. How does he explain microaggression? He says microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or un unintentional. I've highlighted some of his key points, so if that strikes anything, we'll talk more about it. Um, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial, gender, sexual orientation, and religious lights, and insult to the target person or group. Perpetrators of microaggression are often unaware that they have engaged in an exchange that demeans the recipient of the, of the communication. So some of the things we see here, these are very brief, subtle kind of expressions, whether verbal, nonverbal, in any ways, and there's something derogatory in that, something hostile, something insulting, and usually towards particular groups. And we see that these groups are minority groups. They are, they are marginalized groups. And even if the person is um, you know, saying something with, uh, in a very well-intentioned way, it may not come across that way. There might be something underlying it. There might be something that demeans the recipient of that maybe a compliment, according to the one who is, uh, you know, making that statement, but for the receiver, it doesn't fit very well, it doesn't feel very well. So we are gonna base our presentation on the understanding of this particular definition of what microaggression is, and um, I, I wonder like if anybody has any reactions to this or have any examples of something that you have seen around you or, you know, have experienced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So a, a great example of that would be, so for example, in the, uh, a, a female walking down the street sees an African-American male coming towards her, clenches her purse, and sort of moves to the other side of the, to the, other side of the street. You go and ask her, she just maybe doesn't even realize that she did it. It's just, I moved to the other side of the street because I, but there might be a, so it's intentional of, I don't feel safe, or there's some sort of message there, so she's moving, but not, she's not intentionally trying to hurt this individual, but there's sort of an automatic reaction of, hmm, I'm going to just pick up and I'm going to move myself right over the street, and it happens almost so automatically. Um, another example could be the person who is speaking with someone who English is not their first language, and all of a sudden you hear them speaking louder. <laughs> so, and they may not even realize that they're speaking louder, but when you would ask them what's going on, they, well, I just want to make sure that the person can understand me. Well, they're not hard of hearing. They just may have a different language, right? But, so it's these sort of very subtle things that often can be well-intentioned um, or not, uh, but that they may not, on their conscious level, even recognize that they're doing it until it's pointed out. And so that's where, when we're talking about intervening, knowing when is this an opportunity that we should be intervening? Am I observing? What am I observing? What's going on here? So that's what that's what we're we're referring to. Does anybody else have any other um, examples? Go ahead, Jeannie. So uh, one of the research study even shows that uh, even mental health professionals who are extensively trained in anti-racist training, even they engage in microaggressions, especially towards African-American clients. So it's not just general people, even if those who are trained, it does happen intentionally, unintentionally in some ways, our unconscious biases, they do come across in, in the way we interact with people of color or people of, uh, you know, marginalized groups. So, um, we are applying five-step model to addressing microaggressions. So the five steps that are necessary to provide help are, um, these five steps, noti not notice the event, interpret it as a problem, assume personal responsibility, know how to help, and step up. So today we are gonna talk about all these five steps and what are the barriers, and we also want to highlight that for the help to be provided, all these five steps needs to be uh, taken. If any of the steps are missing, the help will not be provided, okay? There are several reasons at each step we can look at, like some of the other reason that will stop us from providing help. Uh, so there are always reasons and you know we can always rationalize why we did not step up, but it's important to be aware of those barriers and sometimes just that educational piece that why I'm not feeling confident or comfortable here can help us move through that barrier and finally end up providing some kind of help. So we're going to talk about each of these step, uh, steps one by one and uh, we'll see how it applies to microaggression. So the first step is notice the event. How many times when we are walking on the street or when we are you know, going our own way, are we paying attention to what's happening around us? I can say most of the time when I walk, I just look at my path and I'm walking. I don't see who's around me and what's happening. We see a lot of time people are uh, on their phone texting, talking, listening to music, or just lost in their own thought. We are not usually paying much attention to our environment. So if you're not paying attention to our environment, there's a high likelihood even if some event happened, whether it was microaggression, or maybe if somebody just slipped behind me, I may not notice that, right? So, and especially with microaggression, if you're not even aware what microaggressions are, it's so easy to lose that. It's so easy to miss it, that you know something just happened here which wasn't right and needs to be addressed. So, being aware of what microaggression is and being aware of your environment 
is the first step that needs to be taken before the help is provided. So the big one when it comes to addressing microaggressions, the biggest problem with microaggressions is interpreting it as a problem. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this particular step than most of our, our other ones because here is where the most conflict and the dilemma happens. Uh, when we say whether you know something that happened, was it me or somebody else? Was something really said in a way that did not fit right? There are certain factors that stop us from determining it as a problem. So the main two factors we are going to talk about today are ambiguity and conformity. So when we talk about ambiguity, um, as one of our colleagues said that it, when something like microaggression happens, it leaves us with the question like, did it happen or is it me who is interpreting it that way? I wonder if any of you have experienced any such situations where you were left with the question of like, what was it? Is it just me adding that meaning or w did that person say or did something? I was just going to say, that's a great example because a lot of times you're not sure what to do with that, sort of like, and so sometimes we're not sure and you don't necessarily want to follow up with the, well, what do you mean by that question? Because then if it really is a genuine compliment, then the part of you that's saying like, I'm just not, am I fishing for you to give me more compliments and tell me that I'm amazing? Or how do I check whether or not this is in fact you you're checking their bias and their assumptions. And so it's really ambiguous. And so the person who's the recipient isn't always necessarily sure what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things with microaggressions are they, they are double meaning. From the, from the person's perspective, he or she made a compliment to you. But from the receiver's perspective, you're not very sure what exactly it meant, what was the underlying assumption of you saying that to me. So that's where the dilemma comes in. So when uh, microaggressions occur, we are left with ambiguity. We are left with the attribution ambiguity because they are so subtle, so covert. It's not like an overt racism where you know something was just done and you can pinpoint to it. This was so much, um, so minor that people usually say, "Why are you worried about it? You know, let it go. It's a small thing." But is it really? What we need to be aware of is like, was it really there? Was the problem really there? Or um, was it not? So we are definitely left with ambiguous, you know, the situation. And usually when the perpetrator is challenged or is confronted, even if you ask them, like, what did you mean by it? They have all the reasons to give, like, oh, this was a compliment. I, I was trying to say this and that. So they might have all kind of rationalizations for their uh, statement or whatever the action they did. Uh, so it becomes really difficult to decide in that moment, like how do you tease apart whether it's a, a type of racism or whether it's really a compliment coming from a genuine place. So in doing that, in looking at like, how do I define it? How do I make sure that I'm understanding it correctly? It depletes a lot of psychological energy. It leaves the receiver with with such a discomfort that Sometimes it's even difficult to ask others, like, did you hear it? Did you, or what did you exactly mean? And the person within themselves, they try to find a meaning of like what it exactly is. And it may take minutes, hours, or even sometimes days 
and sometimes even longer than that to reach a conclusion what just happened in that moment and should I have addressed it or not. So this is the main problem why we see that microaggressions continue to happen and it's difficult sometimes to address as well. Um, also, because from the perpetrator's perspective, they were so well-intentioned that sometimes the receiver starts blaming themselves, that I'm adding a, a wrong meaning to their intentions, and they are ready to dis dismiss their own experience, given that you know, there is there's all kind of rationalization behind why they might have said this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. One of the reasons that we fail to respond sometimes is because it happens in such a spur of a moment and then the moment is lost and we don't know whether I should have responded before even we give a meaning to it, the moment is lost. And sometimes we feel like, you know, maybe I don't know how to address it properly, so I should rather be quiet. So, you know, there are all those factors which we'll be talking about later in our presentation today, but that's a very good point. So the next thing that creates a barrier for us in determining whether it's a problem or not is conformity. We all know and we all go through group pressures, right? So, um, and it is difficult to stand up against uh, group pressures. It's difficult to, to you know, out yourself and uh, get that kind of an attention where you are trying to address something that the whole group or the whole majority is, is confirming with. So, um, when microaggressions happen and you see that, you know, nobody else is responding, we start thinking about why is that so? Sometimes, of course, there is a convenience in, you know, going along with the group and not saying anything, but also because sometimes we wonder, like, maybe others know more than me, and so I should stay quiet. Maybe I don't have the full information. Or sometimes we wonder, like, everybody here is aware that this is not right, but they're not doing anything. So maybe I should also not be doing anything, right? We all have gone through social psychology classes, so I don't have to explain all that in detail. But of course, there are there there is group pressure that stop us from taking action or even checking into like what is happening here, and we just conform with the group. And also because we want to be liked and we don't want to uh, get any kind of negative attention, so we just go along with the group. And uh, with microaggression, something that specifically applies to this is the spiral of silence. Even if you're not saying anything, even if you're just observing it and keeping quiet, you are adding or you are reinforcing that kind of a behavior because you're not addressing it in any ways. So be aware of the, uh, you know, the group pressures because that many times stop us from recognizing that the problem exists and then further ahead of like, you know, addressing it and taking some steps on that. All right, so we also see that uh, there is an external process of microaggression dilemma, which basically means that whether I interpret it as a problem or not is based, is rooted into its own definition of that it's so many times it's unintentional, it's so subtle, it's so invisible that it's difficult to determine whether the problem exists or not. And we are lost into that whole process of figuring out what is happening here. So one of the things that we usually hear is that race does not impact how one is treated or their opportunities for success. How much of that is true or needs to be challenged? Strange to them, like, is this happening? And, like, is this correct? Is it 
yet I think I want to claim there's no racism. We still have all the inequalities. We still have all the discrimination that exists. And, mm -hmm. and even when we talk about representation on our campus, um, how that's reflected. And so like when you're like, in terms of like speaking out and inform, you're the only person, sometimes you become a spokesperson for your group. It becomes more problematic because you're trying to carry this weight. Should I speak out? There's a cost for speaking out, there's a cost for not speaking out. And it's also the sense of, is this really happening? And, we, and you know, um, some of my work is about a rate of traumatic um, race as, racism as trauma. Mm -hmm. We see the same kind of ethnicity mm -hmm. symptoms mm -hmm. um, as a result of these racist experiences. But then it's even more difficult because there's plenty of, a lot of past traumatic events, an ongoing traumatic event. And there's also the sense of like, is this really happening? Yeah, and that's a very good point, recognizing and, you know, having a vocabulary for what you're experiencing. And we also see that we are all socialized and culturally conditioned in stereotypes uh, which are, which basically feed into our unconscious, uh, you know, biases towards certain kind of, certain populations, certain um, specific groups. So it's not that we are coming up with something, but we were socialized in a certain way that unconsciously we have those stereotypes in our mind and that's where these microaggressive statements come across. Um, so when we say that the race does not impact, you know, one's opportunities, people who are in the position of power, according to them, it does not impact. But the best assessment of that situation and especially this statement can come only from the one who is in the marginalized position or who is in that disempowered position because only they can tell how much is, how much are their opportunities getting getting impacted by their particular identities, whether it's race, whether it's their sexual orientation, or whether you know any other um, identity, which is not very accepted by the society. So uh, the the thing that I'm going to add, not to sort of take us off track too much, is you know I'm aware that we're in a room full of psychologists, and so. Um, even thinking about our role, at, so we wouldn't have this conversation necessarily with the students that we're presenting this to and inviting them to step up, but thinking about our role as psychologists and as therapists and how sometimes we may be unintentionally be engaging in some of these microaggressions and then as supervisors thinking about, oh no, I'm a multiculturally competent supervisor and I engage in sort of the cross-cultural supervision and the mentoring, but not recognizing that the student, the intern, the person who has the least amount of power may not be experiencing it the same way that you are approaching it and so these that in invisibility of the unintentional bias is present and I think that you know as a trainee you don't have it's I call it the illusion of choice you don't really have choice to not explore your biases it's something that is ingrained in every step of the way as you go through graduate school something about when we get licensed and we become supervisors and training directors and what all of a sudden we have the little bit of more choice and like yeah yeah I'm engaging in that but we don't really have to we we're encouraged to invited to we should but we don't always really challenge ourselves to look at the biases that we may unintentionally hold to the same degree that our trainees are ha forced to on a day-to-day -day basis within every aspect of their training and so I think it's just a little sidestep that I want to make sure to highlight with this particular group as we think about how to intervene and step up because you may be the colleague of one of those supervisors who thinks they've got it and they might have really missed it and not know. Mm -hmm. And we also see that those who uh, engage in microaggression, they view it as minimal harm. So now, you know, what is the big deal? So they try to minimize the impact of whatever they said or whatever they did and like let it go. And they also encourage those who are affected by it to not bother much, much about it. We usually hear statements like, it's such a small thing, why are you bothered about it? 
But uh, when these small things happen again and again, over and over again, the cumulative effect is mm -hmm. anger, frustration, irritability, mm -hmm. so many other psychological, uh, you know, impacts on the individual and at the at the major societal level as well. But it's not just one one time thing. These things are experienced by marginalized groups over and over, and the cumulative effect is really larger than just you know what we hear that what's the big deal in that? There is a big deal, and we also see that the overt racism is uh, is more acknowledged is more acknowledged in the way that yes it does have impact on person's uh, psychological as well as physical health, but the microaggressions are not acknowledged. In reality, these are just two different forms of racism. There's not much of a difference. One is more visible, one is more invisible. So why do we acknowledge more of racism, the overt racism, compared to microaggression? So that's something for us to think about. And also, you know, if anybody has any comments, I would like to welcome. And I saw a hand going up here. I'll share a time where I've stepped in it. Not stepped up, I stepped in it. Um, and so in my role as the training director, as, in, as intern cohorts come in, I try and facilitate spaces for conversation, self-exploration, identifying their biases. Um, and so a number of years ago, I had a particular training cohort that had a really strong religious faith background. Um, nothing wrong with that, that's great, amazing. Um, we are a very LGBT, supportive campus and so I wanted to invite an opportunity to ex explore the intersections of spirituality and um, sexual orientation so in that invitation the way that the particular trainee experienced that was not um, as much of an invitation but almost a sort of a, my bias that you can't have a strong this was her perception that my bias that you can't have a strong religious basis and still be a strong supporter of the LGBT community. So the way that I phrased it in whatever way that that was, that's how she received it and perceived it and it was very subtle in the way that I created the, the dialogue. Um, I was fortunate enough that the trainee having a lot of sort of internal conflict ultimately came to me and said, can I check in with you? What was intended by this and the way that you said that because this is how I experienced that. That person took a lot of risk in doing that and what, the risk of me saying like, oh, you're being so overly sensitive. That's not what I meant. And so I didn't respond in that way. Instead, I thought, let me step back and look. Do I have a bias that there is this potential um, conflict between those two because maybe I, that's maybe that's ultimately what I was coming from but I wasn't thinking about it in that space but it goes back to the comment that was being made over here is that sometimes we're just so socialized in a certain way that we're not even thinking that underneath it all there may be this other layer of a bias and so it was my my well-intentioned desire to create this sort of space of exploration and conversation which highlighted a potential bias for me and then it put the position the person who is in the least position of power to have to then bring it and highlight it to me and then run the risk of being overly sensitive so ultimately i i like to look at it as a I stepped in it, but I also look at it as it was an opportunity. So it provided me with an opportunity to engage in reflection and a dialogue to understand the impact that this had on the trainee, even minimal or not, that there is a space to have a conversation around it. But that isn't always present. Those paper cuts can really hurt. And if you're covered in paper cuts, it is a big deal. 
So while the person who's making the microaggression might say, well, he's being very sensitive, just somebody who might, you know, cry at a paper cup, although they can really hurt, you might say, oh, that's, that's not a broken limb. Mm -hmm. He's so sensitive that the person who's receiving the microaggression is walking around covered already mm -hmm. in paper cuts from every other microaggression mm -hmm. they've experienced. Yeah. Or keep in the paper cut in the same spot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the next thing which we see here, that what I'm hearing from, uh, from everybody is like it's really difficult to bring up when you are experiencing microaggression and also like making sure that this is happening. So how, what can we do to make sure that we are not just responding as somebody who is sensitive but also like looking deeply into it. So what we can do here is on our part is that we can investigate more about, you know, okay, so I noticed something just didn't feel right to me or something just happened with somebody. So did you also notice, did you notice something happening? What was your reaction to, you know, what some, what so-and-so said? So we can investigate from people around us and that will help us tease out some of the, you know, reactions that we are having. And also, uh, if your gut is saying something just happened, maybe sometimes it's, uh, it's better to, you know, uh, be cautious and, you know, act according to what what your, what your reaction to that situation is. And also be mindful of the group pressure, as we were talking about, you know, how the, uh, how when we don't speak up, or how when we think that everybody else is aware, but they're not responding, so maybe I should not respond as well. So be aware of the pressure, and sometimes if you feel like this needs to be addressed, then go for it. And if you yourself are a victim, it's important to, bring it up and maybe ask for help. Look for people who think alike. Look for people who can be allied to you. Or look for somebody who can support you and maybe go from there. So the dilemma definitely um, makes it difficult to address microaggressions, but there are ways that we can try to get more support from people around us to tease apart what's happening in the situation. So part of it is, is then, again, taking on this, assuming the personal responsibility, right? So it, might, it happens so quickly. So should I step up? I don't uh, Maybe the other person doesn't. I experience that as that, that I observe that to be a microaggression. But maybe the person themselves is like, that's a paper cut that I don't want to deal with today, right? And so, but research shows us that if you're by yourself, you're likely to intervene 80% of the time in a situation versus if you're with a group maybe about 20% of the time. So I think part of it is asking yourself, like, where do I stand? And is this an instance where I need to sort of assume that personal responsibility? If you don't assume the personal responsibility to some degree to intervene, and there's different ways of intervening, then you're not likely to actually step up. You're not likely to, to sort of help support that individual. You might think, oh my goodness, I'm not the person who is the most qualified. <laughs> like maybe I shouldn't be the one that should be um, saying anything in this particular situation. Who am I? I'm, I'm microaggressing all over the place. So why am I going to step in at this place? So part of it is is you need to ask yourself. Um, um, we we often think somebody else is going to do this for us, and so as Conwar already pointed out, is that. If we continue to allow these things to just pass us by, then over time, they are going to only continue to perpetuate themselves. And so at some point, you need to sort of engage in sort of your own self-reflection and sort of believe that you have a personal responsibility to actually step up. And if it's not you, then who? Who's going to do it? Because I'm sure, whether or not in the moment, the person who was the recipient of the microaggression may or may not necessarily have the language, they may at some point be able to reflect back saying, thank goodness somebody else, because I'm too exhausted to always have to sort of intervene on my behalf saying, no, you, you can't say that, no, you can't do that, or what, what was meant by that? Sometimes it's nice to have someone else do that, be an advocate for us on our behalf, or for whatever community um, that is experiencing that. So some of the things, just for the interest of time, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, is some of the things that get in, in the way. Like, I mean, most of you should be familiar with all of these. These are the things that get in the way of us taking our own personal responsibility or feeling like I need to actually intervene on some level. And so I think that this is, this is really important for us to be aware of. 
Um, and I think when you're working with students and you're trying to help them under this, understand the importance of intervening, this is where in the program you might really tease apart some of these a little bit more. And really, if you were just in the goals and action, I would use some of the goals and action in terms of identifying um, pathways around the barriers. These are all barriers. So you want to find ways around these to help you reach the goal of being supportive of and addressing whatever microaggression that exists. The other thing is, is that sometimes we don't know how to help. We're not sure what to do. Should I say something? Should I physically intervene? Should I just check in with the person later? Like sometimes we're not actually clear what is the best thing for us to do. And so we don't feel like we necessarily have the resources to do it. And so sometimes how to help depends on the level of urgency. And so I think a lot of times as psychologists, we're always thinking emergency levels, emergency levels. But there's a lot of non-emergency um, <laughs> helping that can happen. And so part of it is, is this something that you, if we think about our settings, if we think about our counseling centers, if we think about our clients, is this something that you've maybe seen once? Is it something that's happening more regularly? Is this something that, you know, what is the duration and severity of the microaggression that you're experiencing? Because that might influence how you intervene. Maybe I'm going to pull this person aside and say, you know, I've noticed you keep saying this. I don't know how the person who's receiving it feels, but this is my experience of that. And do a quick check-in, colleague to colleague, or, you know, student to student. And so they may be like, get out of my business. You're, I hope not. But that could happen, right? And so you want to think about um, these factors when you're thinking about how to help and how to intervene. These are really critical components that we sometimes forget about. Um, and so the other thing that influences whether or not we intervene is really asking ourselves, what is the cost of intervening. What happens if I actually step into this and I step up and I say something? Am I going to rupture a relationship? Am I going to make someone feel embarrassed? Am I going to highlight a, a bias sees that I didn't think that they knew that they had and so then I'm going to feel responsible for that? I mean, so what is the cost of intervening? Um, am I always going to be the person that's overly sensitive? Oh my gosh, why are you being so politically correct all the time? And it's like, no, I'm not being politically correct. I'm trying to be promoting of human you know, experiences and sort of really trying to create a safe space. And so what is the cost of intervening that I think is important for us to consider? So Thanks. as we are all related to UC campuses, it's important for us to recognize what is the impact of microaggression on our college campuses? So at individual level, we definitely see when somebody is experiencing microaggressions, they do experience anxiety, paranoia, of course. You know, if somebody is making some kind of statements, I'm not going to trust them, and, you know, I don't know what to think about me. So uh, in our uh, technical terms, we can call them as paranoid. Uh, depression, sleep difficulties, all these, this list of whole mental health issues. But is it individual's own problem, or is it more at the systemic level? So is it like intrapsychic, or is it from the environment? So that's something for us to be aware of, like why is the student experiencing this? Is it something happening on our campus that needs to be addressed at a larger level, or is it something with this individual, and I can just have an individual you know, therapy sessions with this person and can help him or her get better? So definitely psychological impacts on students is there at the individual level, but there are a lot of things that, uh, imp there are a lot of things that gets impacted at the systemic level. So if people of color or people of marginalized groups are not feeling safe uh, on campus, whether it's because uh, they have been microaggressed against or maybe there is, whether it's overt racism or covert racism, especially if, you know, there, there's this subtle kind of microaggression going on, how can they feel safe? They would probably end up feeling hostile. Uh, they would experience their environment as hostile and invalidating of their identities. It's a place which is not accepting them as who they are. Would they want to stay on that campus? Or would they want to leave and go somewhere else? Would they want to come to the class? Or would they want to rather miss the class and stay at home? Would it impact their performance? Would they feel that they belong to the university or not? So all these things at the systemic level can impact, you know, uh, 
the group as a whole. So, of course, we also see when microaggressions happen on campuses, it can lead to misunderstandings between the individuals and sometimes between different departments. And the quality of life may suffer. The individual uh, may not feel comfortable and may start isolating himself or herself. And as a group, the group may start isolating themselves from, from the university or from the campus and may not engage in you know, the activities that the campus offers them. So in the same way, the access to education, employment, and healthcare also gets affected by if the campus environment is microaggressive towards a certain group. So I'm aware of the time and that we've run out of time, but so one of the things that as we start to sort of just wrap up here, what I would um, say that as we actually do the step up program on our campus, we would then sort of, in each of these sections, we would break them down in much more detail. And then we talk about resources, how to gain support um, if you are the recipient of microaggressions and you're not necessarily sure how to sort of get support and sort of as you see these sort of the impacts that can happen on the individual and systemic level. So we'll talk about accessing counseling center or accessing just other mentors or people on the campus and sort of spaces that they can go to. Um, we'll also, um, for any of you who are interested in sort of figuring out how to tailor or maybe bring this program to your campus, um, we have our um, uh, email address and you can always um, get but also on our step up website which is the campus website we have also sort of included this as a way to continue to sort of um, bring this um, program to other areas. I mean, I think within the UC system, we as professionals need to really sort of be dedicated to trying to do our role and our part around social justice and making sure that the students on our campus feel like our campus can be a supportive space. So with that, we're aware that um, we've run out of time and so we just really appreciate your um, attention today and um, presence here and so thank you and we'll stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions but we also need to be aware that other people need to get in to present so and if anybody wants access to the program or wants to reach out to us in any for any other reasons you are welcome to take our contact information and email us yes. yeah so this website it just says step up bystander.uci.edu so this is the basic step up, not for the microaggression. So if you want access to the step up against microaggression program, please email Dr. Diaz, and then she'll add, let me. Yeah, probably. They're in the process of loading this one onto that website. They're just a little delay technology-wise, but okay. Thank you. Thank you.